criminals are some of the most unsafe people to be around, as they can hurt us. However, some of them are even more dangerous. From dangerous inmates such as Ted Bundy to Christopher Scarver, here are the 20 most dangerous prison inmates in the world. Robert Hansen If you think about it, humans are not all that different from animals, as even science has a whole lot of writings to back that up. This is shown in how predatory we are and how we have always hunted animals for food. However, when we move past hunting for food and also for sport, we got a new level in predatory ranking. For centuries, hunting animals for sport and displaying a part of them was a thing, and it currently still happens. So when this activity is taken to the next level, then it becomes questionable. This is exactly what Robert Hansen did when he went on a human hunting spree in 1973, which lasted for 12 years. If we think about it, it looks quite wild, especially considering how he was never caught during that period. That's like a decade and some years, and this man literally kept a smile on his face and sold pastries at his bakery just like every other good citizen. But he definitely wasn't a model. This guy realized that the quiet Alaskan community of Anchorage was a great place to undertake his perverse desire, which included kidnapping sex workers and exotic dancers. After this, he would let them out in the woods, then hunt them. If that isn't sick, we don't know what is. He finally met his Waterloo when he kidnapped a young woman, Cindy Paulson, and she managed to escape. With further investigations and trials, he later confessed to his heinous act in 1984. Ted Bundy With so many movies all made to understand the motive behind his decisions and killings, no one could really understand this serial killer. This man, Ted Bundy, caused a lot of damage to families with his actions, and the damage couldn't be undone. But first, who is Ted Bundy? We know he wasn't a good guy because he wouldn't be on this list, but then, who was he? On paper, he's one of the most notorious killers that ever walked the streets of the United States. Unlike other serial killers, Bundy utilized his charms and managed to lure his victims to secluded places before killing them. Based on his strategy, most of his victims were women and a few men. This guy was kind of like picking them off the shelf as he stalked his prey before making his move. However, the way he was able to avoid law enforcement all through this time was quite wild. When he was caught in 1975, law enforcement didn't even have an idea of who they'd caught, but no one escaped having 12 decapitated heads in their apartment. Oh, scratch that, only Bundy can try to escape that as he tried to escape from imprisonment twice and still went on to commit three murders before he was finally apprehended and executed by electrocution on January 24, 1989. Eric Rudolph When you close your eyes and picture a sociopath, would you picture an upstanding citizen? The answer would often be no, but then everyone is capable of crime. This is the story of Eric Rudolph, the sociopath who bore so many aliases just to commit terrible crimes. You know, unlike serial killers who used hand weapons on their victims, it's usually crazy when it's a military weapon. Our guy here was known for his penchant for using bombs without remorse. But how does a regular person learn how to build bombs? Simple, they join the military. This is what Rudolph did until he was discharged in 1986 for using marijuana. After that, he just decided to start blowing up places, and crowded locations became his playground. For instance, during the Summer Olympics in 1996, Rudolph detonated a bomb at the Atlanta Olympic Centennial Park and killed two people. From there, he got high on the attention and decided to try other smaller targets while taking out people. He did this until 1998, when a warrant was issued for his arrest. But you know, man has got military training, so he utilized it. To even make it more interesting, a bounty of $1 million was placed on him. However, he managed to stay safe until 2003 when he was apprehended by a rookie cop. For his troubles, he bags four life sentences and another 120 years for the bombing. So yeah, if you think what he did was bad, wait until you hear about the medical guy in this next clip. Joseph Mengele The world war is one everyone wants to forget easily. But for the Jews, it's something that would be quite tough. This is due to the inhumane handling they got from the Nazis, who treated them like guinea pigs to test out ridiculous and crazy experiments. 
this was a common practice at the concentration camps. One man decided to take that cruelty to the next level, and his name was Joseph Mengele. It was said that his mere appearance shook the core of the prisoners, and he held his notoriety. During the war, Mengele was a physician. Prior to that, he was a medical doctor who was averse to the Nazi movement. But then by 1931, ambition set in. At that time, the Nazi party was gathering momentum, and he decided to study the party and see what he could achieve through them. Hitler happened next, and by 1938, he became a full-blown party member and was a huge supporter and practitioner of racial science, a theme Hitler used to segregate other races and proclaim the Aryans as the supreme race. By the time he was fully indoctrined, Mengele was already cutting through people so much that he earned the name Angel of Death. After the war, he fled to South America because he was too cowardly to stand up to his crimes, and he lived there till he died in 1979. John List It's not just any criminal that gets to have movies written about them. Their case has to be interesting to make that list. And John's story did, but his story is one that still baffles everyone after all these years, as if it's just quite bizarre, especially when we consider the religious undertone. A successful young man, about 46, who's an accountant and always goes to church, loses his job and then couldn't live without it. If you look at it, there are millions of these stories, but then what pushed John List to do what he did? Psychologists believe it was PTSD from his military life, but that doesn't excuse his crime. After he lost his job, he one day goes home and decides to kill his family just so he can save them from the woes of this world, so they can go to heaven. The next day, he literally does all that as he kills his mom, wife, and three teenage kids. The crazy part is that he then makes a sandwich and empties his bank account, then just leaves the house. But not before he cut out his face from all family pictures and disappeared for about 18 years. When his story was featured on America's Most Wanted, all it took was a descriptive burst to blow his cover. A neighbor had found parallels between the story of Robert Clark, his new alias, and that was all it took for him to be apprehended. He got several life sentences before he died in prison in 1982. Ira Einhorn if you think you're bad, try escaping the clutches of law enforcement for 23 years, then get two world powers to compete on your extradition. Tough, right? We know, especially since you aren't a unicorn, or let's say, the unicorn. We didn't name him out of the blue, but that was the nickname for Ira Einhorn, an American environmental supporter who later on murdered his girlfriend and almost escaped the firm grip of the law. His case was funny because on paper, this was a good guy fighting for the environment after serving the nation for years. As a known name in the environmentalist society in the 60s and 70s, he stood his ground on things like keeping the environment safe. It wasn't until March 28, 1979, when he was convicted for the murder of his girlfriend, that the world saw him for what he was. His girlfriend, Holly, who had been dating for five years, had broken up with him, and he couldn't deal with it. So when she came to collect her stuff at the house, he murdered her and stashed her body in a trunk for 18 months. For a case, you know, jail time is knocking, and since it's murder, it's going to be a long time. This was his fate until he broke bail and escaped to Europe under a new alias and lived there for the next 23 years. He even got married and was literally chilling until he was arrested in France. And he wasn't done with the theatrics. As his extradition became renowned, well, maybe he's the unicorn after all. The matter dragged on till 2001, when he was finally sentenced to life. He died in 2020 while in prison. Andrew Cunanan The fact most renowned killers were either charming or smart has made most people believe that it all originates from psychopathy. Oh, that's no longer the name, as it's now called antisocial personality disorder, and maybe that makes it seem much more cool. Or maybe these guys took it too seriously and then decided, let's see how far we can get with this. So, that's why the case of Andrew Cunanan still baffles everyone, because this man was a genius. Not like his murders were artistic, like other murderers we would touch on, but because he was a genius with an IQ of 147. It said that he memorized the encyclopedia at 10 and was able to churn out answers to any question asked. However, that wasn't what gave him notoriety and he became renowned for his murder of Italian designer Gianni Versace. He had murdered the designer in front of his Miami Beach home. 
and this had raised questions as to the relationships between both men. From the available data, we know that both men met at a party, and Versace misidentified him. But then Kunanen took the hype and went around with the new friend. However, prior to their meeting, Kunanen had been on a killing spree in the US, killing four people, of which some were his lovers and former acquaintances. The murder of Versace, however, was what ended him as he escaped from the scene and was spotted later. Maybe because of his nature of being a societal con man, he couldn't imagine life in prison, so he shot himself eight days later. Let's be honest, this doesn't provide enough motive because he could still have escaped. But well, maybe he was tired of running and decided to turn off the switch. His death must have been better than the next guy on this list, who got a bullet between his ears for his troubles, Andre Chikatilo. If you thought serial killers were only domiciled in the United States, then you would be wrong. You wouldn't be the only person to think that, just like the people of the Soviet Union, at least until they had their first publicized serial killer. That's when they agreed it was a universal phenomenon. The case of Andrei Chikatilo was one that rocked the Soviet Union, and no one was safe. This was because the man was literally having a serial killing fest and there wasn't even enough technology to hold him down for the crimes which lasted for years. Think about it, a quiet man who was a school teacher, killing young people and cutting off parts of their bodies. Does that even sound compatible? That's like saying the five-year-old down the street was a rocket scientist. What are the odds? Anyway, Andre was able to avoid suspicions despite his several arrests as there was no evidence to show for it. Even when he was sacked constantly from teaching jobs, no one felt he could be that bad. No one even drew a parallel with the sexual assault he carried out as a kid on another kid. Well, 52 bodies and give or take 11 years later, he was arrested again, but not for any murder, just based on suspicions, especially during a time of a heightened search when a renowned psychologist decided to interview him in a bid to understand the mind of a serial killer he was shocked and unknowingly took him to the sites where he buried the bodies. He claimed to have killed about 56 people and only 53 bodies were uncovered. It's the Soviet Union, when stuff like this happens, the culprit is definitely getting a bullet to the head. And that's what happened to him on February 14th, 1994. Israel Keys. If you attend a funeral and heard the pastor say, he's not in a better place, he's in a place of torment. Wouldn't you be taken aback? Like, who's this person and what have they done for a pastor to say those words? Those were the words spoken at the memorial of Israel Keys, one of the most methodical serial killers the United States has ever seen. Most times, serial killers, just like every human, follow patterns and soon enough live based on those tenets. However, when one steps outside of that, then they have to be feared. Most times, when these types of people commit crimes, they go scot-free because there's no pattern for law enforcement to follow. So when Israel operated this way until he met his fall when he was kidnapped and killed 18-year-old Samantha Kinning, he had gone to her workplace, a coffee shop, requested a drink, and then brought out a gun to rob her. But the thing was that he wasn't robbing her. He kidnapped her, took her to his apartment, sent a ransom text, and requested $30,000. However, he still went on to kill her and sew her eyes open so he could take a picture to show her loved ones. As fate would have it, he was caught from a tip about the truck and imprisoned, and this was where he confessed all his crimes. He had been killing people randomly all over the United States, and he even planned it by keeping a murder kit at their place, sometimes two years before he came to murder them. Now that's some sick stuff. On December 2nd, 2012, he took the easy way out by killing himself but still stood on the fact that all his murders were done because he enjoyed them. Tamra Samsonova The Baba Yaga is a name from the popular bedtime stories for most Eastern European kids, and it's told of a vicious killer. However, over time, the Baba Yaga has taken on several identities, and recently it's a woman known as Tamra Samsonova, who gathered fame for the way she killed her victims and disposed of their body parts. When you see an elderly woman, there's a high chance that you won't think she's a killer, at least until her last murder. That's what everyone thought of her, especially as she worked as a caregiver for a 79-year-old woman. The old woman was her final victim, as they had a row about her not washing a teacup. This led to her drugging the old lady before cutting her into pieces and dropping them in a nearby pond. The crazy and scary part of all this 
was that she didn't kill the woman before butchering her. After the body parts were found, she was caught with other body parts in her apartment and brought in. That didn't scare her, as she went on to mention other murders she had carried out in the area, and it all felt like she was enjoying it. This woman literally had a journal where she documented all her previous murders and how she disposed of them. The whole thing was just so bizarre that they had to take a psych evaluation and it turned out she was mentally ill. Now let's get ready for today's missing topic. One thing everyone wants to avoid is coming face to face with a criminal who has a record of killing their victims. These guys are usually so bad that they most times either don't see us as humans or they have a lost touch with their humanity. Just like in the photo we have here, we see a person who has mutilated themselves and has face paint or tattoos that look quite scary. However, when we look closely, we can see that they have a childish face, which one wouldn't attribute to crime. From where we stand, we can't actually say if this is a real person or a computer-generated image. However, it looks a bit real. So what do you think? Do you feel like this is a real person? Or are those scars on their body a sign of the number of people they've hurt? We'd like to hear your opinion in the comment section below. Kindly use the hashtag missing topic. We're sure the spotlight will be on you. The Freeway Killer As a serial killer having a body count of, let's say, 22 bodies in the space of a year should earn the person some high position on any list or ranking. That's crazy because how are you killing 22 people and getting away with it? Well, all this seemed like child's play for William Bonin who went on a killing spree and put fear in the heart of every man and woman who plied the highways of the United States. Soon enough, he was given a befitting nickname, the Freeway Killer, as he usually left the body of those he killed on the freeway. He had been abusing people since he was 21, but then all of that developed into a more murderous movement. He became quite violent, including mutilation, beating, kidnapping, and other vices. With frequent arrests, he was mostly released, and the usual citation was that he was mentally unstable to be sentenced to jail. He had more of a manic disorder and really enjoyed the fact that he was killing people. At least he wasn't alone, as he usually had an accomplice for all of these murders. Finally, he was caught, and on February 23, 1996, he was executed, where families of his victims kept a vigil. Rose West They say two heads are better than one. And this is true because it usually leads to success in whatever they do, be it sports, arts, or even going on a killing spree for almost 20 years. This is the story of a couple who decided they wanted to create a buzz in the UK and put it in the news for something crazy. The couple, Fred and Rose, both felt it was cool to murder innocent women. Thinking about it, the murders were so gruesome that they buried the remains of the dead in their basement for years and no one knew. Unless we count the funny jokes their kids made about their sister being buried under the patio. Yeah, it's exactly what you're thinking. The couple also killed their daughter, Heather, and buried her under the house. But it's still yet unclear as to the reason. Investigators soon popped up about the disappearance of Heather in 1987. This led to the discovery of the House of Horrors, as remains of those who had been killed were dug up in February 1994. This led to the house being torn down and everything else burnt. In a bid to escape the atrocities, the husband killed himself while the wife had to bear the brunt of everything they had done, as she currently serves a life sentence. Samuel Little When the FBI named him the most prolific serial killer in the United States, it must have earned him a lot of reputation in the criminal world. Although he doesn't have much media coverage, Samuel Little is one serial killer the law enforcement world and the U.S. wouldn't forget over time. This man had a record of about 93 deaths to his name, and most of his murders weren't as brutal, so it was usually filed under unsolved murders. Since his murders were usually through strangulation, he went on for years with death in his wake from 1970, which went on till around 2005 when he was caught. It even got so ridiculous that the FBI, who was in charge of the case, had to call on people to come up and try to match his confessions with missing people. That's how much murder he gathered, and another issue the law enforcement faced was the inconsistencies with his story, as the time span was a long one. Since most of his victims were women, it was usually very easy to overpower them, either on a street corner or at their homes. When he was finally caught and convicted, he was sentenced to four life sentences without parole, 
and that's where he was until he died in 2020. He was lucky not to have been in the same prison as the next guy on this list. This guy was some sort of vigilante, and the bad guys actually got what was coming for them. Christopher Scarver. What happens when the bad guys are being hunted? Do we place this bad guy above the other bad guys? Or is there a predatory chain in the serial killing world? Well, if anyone played the role of the apex predator in the serial killer's world, it would be Christopher Scarver. When he was convicted for the crime of killing Steve Lohman and sentenced to the Centennial Correctional Center, they thought they were locking him away. It seems our guy was like a good, bad guy because he went in there like an undercover agent and did some really dirty work. We're talking about taking out bad guys, the kind of jobs that left most people in a bittersweet moment. Okay, so while in jail, Scarver murdered two notorious killers and kind of gave their families a sense of justice. While in prison, he was in the same facility with Jeffrey Dahmer and Jesse Anderson, who he stabbed with a makeshift weapon that he formed using a piece of metal he got from gym equipment. Due to the vigilante role he took, he was convicted of additional murder and two more life sentences were added to his rap sheet without even the possibility of parole. The crazy part of all this is that he might have been paid to even undertake this job, but he attributed his actions to being told to by God. Long Island Serial Killer If you're like us and you like unsolved murder mysteries, then you have heard about one of New York's longest crime hunts. Yes, this is due to the fact that the search has been ongoing for years with bodies discovered which have been buried since 1996. If you still haven't figured it out, then we should just come out clean and say we're talking about the Long Island serial killer. The fact that this case is still unsolved makes it quite scary, and based on the information available, everyone is just waiting for the dominoes to fall in place. With about 10 to 18 victims dug out from the areas of Long Island, everyone has asked the question of this killer's identity especially considering the fact that most of the victims were female and they mostly had placed an ad on Craigslist about soliciting customers. Based on this, we can say that the killer is male and either has the intention to subdue his victims for a sexual gratification or was born out of a disdain for their job. But who are we to judge? With the serial killer still at large, a $25,000 bonnie has been provided for anyone with information about their arrest. Who knows? Maybe one day they may just turn up, or maybe not. This next duo isn't so lucky as they get to pay for their sins. Lawrence Bitteker Some serial killers can be very twisted in the way they undertake their crimes, and this can give us an idea of their motives. For some, it's a lack of parental care, while others had bad sexual lives growing up, hence the need for control. This is also the case for Lawrence Bitteker who went on a five-month murder trip and put several families in mourning. His method of killing was so brutal that even law enforcement agents had to tag it as some of the sickest murders ever witnessed. There was no finesse in his methods, and he mostly used tools found in the garage to maim and decapitate his victims. Someone must have seen the trail of bodies he left behind and named him the Toolbox Killers, alongside his partner, Roy Norris. The duo set out to hunt teenage girls or sometimes hitchhikers who unsuspectingly entered their van. Now you can imagine the fear in a young girl's eyes when she's caught by the pair. The realization would most times set in. For the whole of the five months they operated, Los Angeles was on high alert as everyone was being careful not to fall victim. They met their fall when Roy Norris confided in a former Patty about the escapades. On hearing everything, he informed law enforcement so the duo was arrested and further investigation led to their final incarceration, where they were until they died. Man with a thousand faces When most murderers commit the crime, they often feel remorse or even try to hide the fact so as to blend back into society. This is because they have a life that's most likely filled with people they care about and those they love. However, when you see a murderer who was proud of their crime, then you know you're dealing with a sadistic person. This is exactly what the man with a thousand faces did when he killed an innocent woman at a motel without any reason in 2011. Jamie Osuna, who also has several aliases, was so proud of what he had done and he even smiled when being questioned. For us, this would have been the time to question his mental health, but then the law enforcement just locked him up for life. For every criminal, there's always almost a second time, and that's exactly what Osuna did while he was in state prison. 
he one day woke up and decided to be the judge, jury, and executioner of his roommate murdered in 2019. The case was everywhere and everybody had something to say. After further investigation, he was found to be mentally unstable, and this guy even went as far as firing his attorney. He spent the remainder of his days behind bars. Quincy Allen If most people were told to choose their execution method, there's a high chance that the response would be tears. Not like death by tears, but that would be crying because they have to be executed. However, when Quincy Allen was offered the same option, he chose electrocution and the date was almost set until his attorney sought a federal appeal. So how did he get to this point? Well, we can say that Quincy had been a very bad boy and he left a trail of murder in his wake. During his conviction in 2005, he pleaded guilty to the murder of two men and the shooting of another who survived. This interesting fact was that he wasn't just a first-time murderer. This guy had been dropping bodies and even burning them. However, his case took a weird turn when he and another inmate stabbed a guard a few weeks after he was sentenced to execution. What was he doing all this for? The fun of it? Did he have a vendetta against most of the people he killed? Well, these are the questions we may never get answers to. But one thing we know is that one more murderer is off the streets. Donald Smith. Sometimes wolves are in sheep's clothing, and we don't notice until they've done something severe. Most times we welcome them in, and when they show their true colors, the devastation is usually hard to handle. This is exactly what happened to the Periwinkle family, who had dealt with the hand of fate when ex-convict Donald Smith had come into their lives. Smith, who was an elderly man, had met the family at a store and conversed with them before inviting them to Walmart, where he would buy stuff for them. No one knows how the mother fell for this simple trap as they followed him in his van until they got to Walmart and he tricked little Cherish away from the rest of the gang. He would abuse her and after that strangled her to death. This is sad because why would you kill a little child after all the suffering you put her through? Can you imagine that after the whole incident, he then threw her lifeless body away and went about like nothing happened? However, he was finally caught and then sentenced to death after over five years of hearing the case in court. Jimmy Spencer Murder is a crime that can almost not be forgiven due to the damage it causes to families. It's like taking something important away from someone and hoping they get chummy with you in return. No matter how much apology is made, the deed has been done and the rest would have to live with it for life. Well, for Jimmy Spencer, forgiveness wasn't going to cut it, especially since it had to do with three families. As he was convicted and sentenced to death, he asked for their forgiveness, but it was too late for that. In 2018, Spencer had killed three people, including a kid, and the reason still wasn't clear. He had just gotten out of jail on parole, and he still decided to commit another violent crime. This would just confirm the saying that once someone has been to prison, it's almost always impossible for them to stay out of it, as they would most often then not commit another crime. This just shows that these institutions aren't reforming anyone, but in a way, they're just there to hold criminals away from society. In the end, those who died were gone, but then Jimmy Spencer had done as much damage as he could. Mm-hmm. <laughs>